Hi ladies, how are you? This is Muhammad Musa from AFK Study Plan. Today is Sunday and I think you get the habit of what's happening every Sunday. So as usual, today we are going to discuss our uh, last um, weekly newsletter question, which is five questions. Today, most of the questions are from ortho topics. So I know like ortho is not very common topic while you studying for AFK because like it's not extremely important in the exam. When you see some ortho question in the exam, you feel like, yeah, it's so easy or it's either so hard. So today we are going to discuss some ortho concepts, ortho questions. I hope it will be beneficial for you. And as usual, like down here, you can see the tag for the question. Left side of the screen, you can see the previous newsletter. Right upper right corner, you can see the clip where you can click it and download the PDF. With that being said, let's just start it. First question. A patient has an increased overjet due to proclined maxillary incisors. Which of the following may occur as a result of correction of this overjet by retroclining the maxillary incisors? So as we start with also topic, you can see there is some definition. If you know the definition, it will be extremely easy for you to answer the question. So here you speak about patient with increased overjet and proclined incisors, and you are going to retrocline it. So what is going to happen for this patient? So here the option, recession, increase overbite, spacing between the teeth, anterior open bite. If you just understand the four terms, overjet, overbite, procline, nitrocline, it will be super easy for you to answer the question. So first, let's speak about overjet. So overjet is a horizontal misalignment of upper front teeth. Overjet is a horizontal relationship. So it's like run in a horizontal plane between the palatal of upper anteriors and Link, uh, labial of lower anteriors so it's a horizontal relationship between them from the front view you can see this way from the side view you can see this way normal value is between two and four millimeter it's very important indication of mal occlusion and the mal occlusion here might be dental or skeletal and there is a um, very important point you should know overjet is the distance between the upper anteriors not all the anteriors just the upper centrals and the lower centrals because like when you go to different exams, ACG, stuff like this, you will be confused. So I would like to clear this concept from now for you. It's distance between the upper centrals and lower centrals. It's not the all upper anteriors and all lower anteriors. And why this make difference? This make difference because when you speak about class 2, we have class 2 div 1 and class 2 div 2. We speak about class 1, div 1 or div 2 according to the relation between the upper centrals and lower anteriors. It's not all the upper anteriors and lower anteriors, okay? <clears throat> overbite is a vertical overlap of upper anterior teeth to lower anterior teeth an overbite as we said is a vertical relationship and it's we, we, we could describe it as a percentage so we're going to say the overbite here is 20% 30% 40% 100% meaning the upper anteriors is covering the lower anteriors up to 20% of the height of the lower anteriors or 40% of the height of lower anteriors. So overbite, we describe it as a percentage of overlap. Normal value between 20 to 40, I think this is a huge range, but like in the textbook to speak about 20 is like good, but not very good. Like 30 to be the optimum, but up to 40 is good. A very important indication of mal occlusion also. So now you can understand difference between overjet and overbite. So how this overjet overbite reflect in your patient mouth? You see here, this is spacing between the teeth. It has nothing to do with like overjet overbite. But in this patient, you can say there is like no overbite because like it's almost open bite, almost open bite, and the overjet is minimal. Here you can see crowding and the overbite on the other side because the like upper anteriors, one tooth is going to the lingual of the lower teeth. And here open bite, like you see here, and here over open bite, deep bite, over bite, like mean this is 100% or even more than 100%. This is cross bite, this is cross bite. And then you can see here under bite, which means the negative overjet. So you can manipulate the term to understand it. But just to cut it short for you, overjet is a horizontal relationship, over bite is a vertical relationship. So let's speak about the other two terms now. Um, one second here. Yeah, this is a normal tooth like in the, you see that um, longitudinal axis of the tooth is almost parallel to the alveolar bone. You can see this 
green line representing the bulb, and you can see this blue lines representing the bone. Here, when you go to the teeth to be proclined, you can see this one is going. The crown is going to be labially positioned and the root on the other way. We call this teeth proclined teeth. And the other way, when we go to the other way, retroclined teeth, you can see the crown is going to the lingual side more than the labial side. So proclined teeth mean the teeth is going labial side, retroclined teeth meaning the teeth is going to the lingual side. So let's solve our question here. So this is a question we have. Patient has increased over jet and we are going because of proclined anterior teeth. We are going to solve it by retroclining the teeth. So we are going to retrocline the teeth, making the teeth going backward. We make the tooth, the teeth going backward. The overjet will be decreased, but the overbite will be increased. So the problem here happening for our patient, the increased overbite because we are going to retrocline the upper anterior teeth to solve the increased overjet. I hope this is clear for you. You can just watch the game, see the terms again, but like again for ortho question. Do not aim for the answer, aim for the concept. When If you understand the four terms, overjet, over by procline, retrocline, it will be easier for you to solve other questions. Second question from ortho orso. A patient's cephalometric values are as follows. SNA, 88, and he giving you the mean value, which is 82. SNB, 82, and the mean value is 80. Which of the following tests describe the patient skeletal basis or skeletal basis? So here we should... Again, understand the SNA, SNB, and then it will be easier for you to understand the concept and get the answer. So he's saying orthognostic maxilla, orthognostic mantle, prognostic maxilla, prognostic mantle, prognostic maxilla, orthognostic mantle, orthognostic maxilla, and prognostic mantle. So let's describe first SNA, SNB, and then get the answer. So SNA, S is a cella tersca, N is a nasium, A is the most convex po po uh, point in the maxilla. This uh, S, S here is cella tersca in the skull. This is the most stable point in your growth. It will not change most. Nasium is here, upper, uh, upside of your nose. And A, as we said, is the most convex part point in your maxilla in the cephalometric. And these value, we cannot state in your patient base in the real life. No, you, did cephal you do cephalometric analysis for your patient and then you go to make it. It is the angle form it by the intersection of SM plane, which is this one, and the line joining nasium to the point A. This angle indicates the anteroposterior positioning of the maxilla in relation to the cranial base. So now we have this plane and this point, so we can get to relate the maxilla to the horizontal plane of the base of the skull or the cranial base. Increased angle indicate prognostic maxilla. More than 82, you say it's a prognostic maxilla. Decrease angle indicate retrognostic maxilla. So if it's more than 82, so you say it's a prognostic maxilla. If it's less than 82, you say it's retrognostic maxilla. So this is SNA. And then let's speak about SMB. SMB, same cella, cella and nasium, but P here is the most um, convex point in the mandible, again in the cephalometric analysis. It's angle between SM plane and a line joining nasium to the point B. This angle again indicates the anteroposterior uh, positioning of the mandible in relation to the cranial base. As you see here, increased angle indicates prognostic mandible. If it's more than 80, so you can say it's a prognostic mandible. Or if it's less than 80, you say it's a retrognostic mandible. But here, there is very important point. So we say the normal for SNA to be 82, the normal for SNB to be 80. What the meaning of more than or less than? So we get to um, agree the value to be 2, plus or minus 2. So if we say it's 83, it's like here in 80. If we say it's 81, 82, we can say, yeah, okay. But starting from 83, 84, 85, so we say it's a prognostic mantle. Again, with 80, we're going down. If it's like 79, 78, minus plus 2, we say it's still in a good way. But if we make it more than 2, it would be maybe 75. So for sure, it's retrognathic mantle. And this patient most commonly would be class 2. And uh, finally, this, as we discuss the concept, let's speak about A and B. A and B is like the point A in the maxilla and nasium here upper upside of your nose and B in the mandible. This angle formed by intersection of the line joining point A and, and B. 
it donates the relative position of maxilla and mandible to each other. So now we say like maxilla is prognostic, retrognostic, mandible is the same. And then we want to know the relation between maxilla and mandible. So two can conclude this patient facial profile. If increased angle indicate class two skeletal pattern more than four. So if the angle is more than four, most commonly this patient will be skeletal class two. And if this angle is less to go to B2, so we can say decrease or negative angle. So we most commonly saying this patient to be class three. And as you can see here from this angle, it's C here from A and B. If this angle increase, this angle is like wide, meaning the mandible is going backward. And if this angle is decreased or even in the negative side, meaning this mandible is going prognostic mandible and retrognostic maxilla, meaning this one most commonly patient will be skeletal class three. So these numbers are important. Sadly, you should know the mean value. Most commonly in the exam will not give you the mean value, but you should know it. And most importantly, you should know this two, deviation of two is still in the normal range. If you say like, let's go to question again and discuss it. So if the mean value of S and A to be 82, if I give you 83, it will be orthognostic maxilla. If I give you 84, this is the cutoff. Cut so you will not most commonly see this number to be in the same range. But when I give you more than two, less than two, so you can say here, 82, and giving you the angle to be 88. So for sure, you can say it's a prognostic maxilla. And here, like 82 is the SMB value, and the mean value is 80. So it's less, but only by two. So we still in the cutoff. So it will be orthognostic mandible. I hope you understand the values. You understand the angle and why we use this angle because this angle are extremely important for you to know your patient has malocclusion to be skeletal or to be uh, dental. And then it will reflect deeply in how you are going to manage this patient and how you're gonna, going to offer him treatment. Third question from ortho also. A 20 years old man is finishing his comprehensive orthodontic treatment that involved a rotated tooth to one. So here we speak about comprehensive treatments. Comprehensive treatment meaning this is like, was not aggressive treatment, but like a big treatment, not like like this one also rotate, only rotated. No, this patient meaning he has a lot of problem, but he giving you only one problem. This is the meaning of comprehensive orthodontic treatment. Rotated tooth to one. What's the next step of treatment? So here he's asking you, you did solve this ortho and you did Rotate the two to one to get it in the correct position. So what's the next step? Perform a circumferential supracrystal fibrotomy. Perform a sub circumferential subcrystal fibrotomy. Circumferential fibrotomy should not be performed. Okay. So here we should understand this term, circumferential fibrotomy. And what's the difference in supracrystal and subcrystal? When you understand it, it will be easier for you to know it. So what the circumferential um, supracrystal fibrotomy means? It's a surgical excision of the free gingival fibers and transeptal fibers to reduce the rotational relapse. So this surgery is done to cut the vipers around the tooth to reduce the rotational relapse, okay? Because rotational relapse is caused by the network of elastic supracrystal fibers returning to its original position. So teeth tend to rotate back to its original position. So you might ask me, so why, especially the rotation movement, we are going to cut the fibers for? And this is a very good question. Because rotation is the last movement we are going to do for our patient. So if we are going to retrocline, procline, move the teeth, stuff like this, the last movement we are going to do is the rotation or derotation to make the tooth go back to its original position. And why is that? Because like when you do, Rotation for the tooth to go from the mal alignment to be in a good position, you need space. Think about it, the upper anterior teeth, when it's rotated, because like the mesiodistal width is totally different from the buccolingual width. Mesiodistal of the tooth is way bigger than the buccolingual of upper anterior teeth. So if your upper anterior teeth is flipped to be like not this way, this way, so it like occupy less space. So to derotate the tooth to its original position, you need space. So that's why this is the last movement you're going to do as orthodontics. So you are going to align the teeth, give a space, and then rotate the tooth to go its original position. And this rotation is, as we said here, has a tendency to relapse because of the supracrystal gingival fibers, okay? 
These surgical cuts are made after a previously rotated tooth is orthodontically moved to its ideal position within the arch. As we said, it's not to be done before, it's going to be done after you finish your treatment and irritating the teeth. This procedure is indicated for severely rotated tooth and is not appropriate for crowding of teeth without rotations. So not every patient with crowding are going to do it for him. No patient with severely rotated teeth and crowding, so you are going to correct it and then do the surgery for him to make sure this tooth will stay in the position <clears throat> because teeth has a memory and the fibers is fighting back to get the tooth back to its original position, which is not a good position and you did orthodontic treatment for this patient to give him a good smile. So you might, when you read this one, you think this is a big surgery, stuff like this. So let me show you a picture because it's so easy surgery. It's not very difficult. You see here, so this teeth has been uh, corrected in a correct position. And then this give him the lingual arch to give fixation. And then you are going to give um, an infiltration. And so you don't give, you don't need to get this patient like, um, um, if you have a nerve block because it's soft tissue surgery, you give him infiltration and then you prepare your tooth, you get your plate and you go. As you see this plate number, I think this is not number 15, this is number <coughs> uh, 11, I think. Correct me if I'm mistaken, but this is not, not number 15. Because as you can see, the plate here is going to go inside the sulcus. He go from the labial side in uh, picture number C to cut the fibers here. And then he go to lingual side to cut the fibers here. And then he goes, uh, go to upper side from the free gingival margin in picture D. And then you make sure he cut all the fibers, all supracrystal fibers. And here, after the surgery, as you can see, minimal bleeding is not a very aggressive surgery. You just go to cut the fibers gently. And you go from down up to cut the fibers to make sure these fibers. And this is a good question here if you think, if you ask about it. These fibers, what is going to happen for these fibers? So you cut the fibers, fibers tend to get the tooth back to the bad position. When you cut the fibers and the teeth now in a good position, these fibers will be remodeled to the connect to the tooth in the correct position. So by this mechanism, you are reducing the chances for these teeth to be relapse again, to be in the bad position before we start the orthodontic treatment. So here the answer would be performed a circumferential supracrystal fibrotomy, not subcrystal, and then we're going to do it to prevent the tooth to go back to the bad position. So that was the three question from ortho discipline. I know like ortho is intimidating, like for everyone, when you, when you study, um, you feel this topic is not, it's not too big, but there is a lot of terms you don't know about it. So I tried my best now to give you terms to explain the, um, meaning of the angles, the meaning of overjet, overbite, a meaning of surgery. So you understand it. When you understand it, it will be easy because I see some dentists trying to memorize the um, stuff for orthodontic treatment. No, this will not be going well for you. You need to understand. When you understand it, you will invest a little more time, but the knowledge in your mind will be solid. And then you can answer the question easily. You will answer the question super easy for this talk. Let's move to different discipline. Let's go to surgery. Impacted maxillary third molars are most commonly vertical, horizontal, mesoangular, disoangular, and this is like pure statistic uh, information you should know. Here, speak about the upper third molar. Most commonly, will be vertical, horizontal, mesoangular, disoangular. Let me give you the reference here. So, vertical impaction of maxillary third molar, the angle accounts for 63%. So vertical would be most likely the one most commonly you would see in your office, 63%. This to angular impaction of axillary third molar account for 25, so this is the second one, and the mesoangular account for 12%. So the most common one would be vertical with 63%, and then this to angular, and then mesoangular. So I speak about vertical to be the most common one, this to angular, second one, mesoangular, the third one. Okay? And then as we hear discussing the topic and the concept, I will give you the same answer or the same concept for the lower teeth. So you can compare between upper and lower and you have a solid knowledge about this concept. So for the lower one, mesoangular impaction is the most common and easiest impaction to remove. So mesoangular is the most common. So for upper is vertical, for lower is mesoangular and the easiest one to be removed, okay? And then the second most common would be the vertical one. The vertical one is second most common and the second most difficult to remove. Here he giving you the difficulty also. 
So for the upper, we speak about vertical to be most common and the easiest one, and the mesio angular, and then um, and then this angular and the mesio angular. Here in the lower, we speak about mesio angular to be most common, vertical the second most common, and the second easiest one to be removed. And here we speak about horizontal, and I don't ex need to explain about this one. Horizontal is uncommon and difficult to remove impaction. But before you think this is the most difficult one, let me show you this picture and then you can tell me which one is more difficult. This is that this two angular is uncommon and is the most difficult of four types of impaction to remove. So to recap it, for the upper, the most common and the easiest is vertical, and then this angular, and then mesio angular. Mesio angular is the like the less common and the most difficult to be extracted. For the lower, we speak about the mesio angular and then vertical and then horizontal and then this angular. So what I recommend you now, you stop the video, get a paper and pen and write it down. Vert upper, one, two, three, lower, one, two, three. When you write it down now, do please do it now, not do it later. Stop the video, get the pen and paper, write it down for you and try to like make any drawing for it. If you do it now, I trust, trust me, you will retain the information for a very long time. If you look at it, you say, yeah, yeah, makes sense, yeah, it's easy, easy. No, you will forget the information soon. Why is that? Because like, now you are hearing and you are watching this video and you see the picture. So you are using only the receiving part of your brain. You're receiving information now. When you try to draw, when you try to get this information out and elaborate the information, so you're using different part of your brain. So getting you to be more efficient in studying this one. And it would be perfect if after this video, you call one of your friends and explain to him, you know, the upper maxillary, um, upper um, wisdom tooth, what's the most common? What is the easiest? What is the hardest to be extracted? If you explain to someone, he will ask you, no, I didn't get this one. So you get to know your study pattern. No, I didn't study it well. I cannot explain. If you cannot explain to someone else, so you, this means, you didn't get the full information. So you need to restate it again. So if you close the circle, and I call it the 3D studying way. So you are studying in a 3D, in three dimension. First dimension, you are receiving the information. Second dimension, you are using different part of your brain to write the information. Third dimension, you explain to someone. If you're doing the 3D circle, so you will have solid knowledge and you will feel more confident about your regimen of study. You will feel, okay, I can now explain it so I know how to explain it to someone. And to make it even like effective for you, try to explain it in a simple term. Think about, okay, so I will explain this one to a child. I'll explain this one to a patient in the office. I will not explain it to a dentist. So when you try to simplify the information more and more, this means your brain is working more and more to analyze, sorting the information, getting to explain the information. So this information will stick in your mind with the aid of the no, uh, of the picture, with the aid of the notes you did, you're good, you're in a very good place. With this way, if you try to implement this routine in your study regimen, trust me, you will get more confidence because this is the feedback I receive most commonly. We are studying, 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 but I don't feel confident about my knowledge. When you try to do it in the th three, 3D dimension, you do it using more than one skill in your brain, it will be easier for you. So here, go back to the question, impact and maxillary third motor, most commonly is the vertical one, okay? Last question from Sergi also. Pure rotational movement of the temporomandibular joint occurs in the superior compartment of TMJ, inferior compartment, anterior compartment, posterior compartment. So here, before we discuss it, we need to know the anatomy of TMJ. So if you know the anatomy, it will be easy for you. And here I'll give you a very simple drawing because like if I give you the big drawing, it will be like, like it, it's, it's not very clear for you. So here we speak about the TMJ. So here is a mandible, here's a condyle, here's muscle of mastication, and here is the fossa here, glenoid fossa of the temporal bone, and here the articulating surface. So we have the condyle articulating with the glomite fossa of temporal bone, and between them we have articular disc. This articular disc, the blue one you can see, is dividing this compartment to be upper compartment and lower compartment. The upper one, as you can see, is the 
up for the articular disc and the lower part is the inferior to the articular disc so this is important for you to understand the anatomy so the anatomy now we have a joint this joint is divided by the articular disc to be upper compartment and lower compartment so let's now see the the real action mechanism for this one so here the detailed picture here you can see this articular disc upper compartment lower compartment and here you speak about the other stuff okay so let's see it now in action so in action when your mandible is moving so it moves in two way or in two phases first phase in the lower compartment where hinge movement just rotational movement is happening for the condyle to rotate in the lower compartment and then when the condyle rotate in lower compartment it will take the disc and it will move forward and when it move forward to pass this part when it passes the posa and go forward it will disclude from the articular surface and go to protrude out of the fossa and go mandible to be maximum opening so for your mandible to open it go through two phases first phase is pure rotation or hinge movement happening in the lower compartment and when it happened in lower compartment it attached to the articular disc and then was forward movement of disc and the mandible at the upper compartment here when action happened with the help of the lateral trigoid muscle to protrude the mandible to go forward and open to the maximum opening so again the movement happened in two phases first phase pure rotation in the lower compartment and then forward movement in the upper compartment and protrusion of the mandible to go to maximum opening of your mandible so here we speak about pure rotational movement of the um, TMJ is the inferior component of the TMJ uh, compartment of the TMJ there is no anterior and posterior he's trying just to trick you here so it's only superior and inferior and this is why I'm telling you when you have solid knowledge when you have solid knowledge of anatomy it will be easy for you to solve surgery and this is why I recommend you when you study you don't study surgery unless you have very good knowledge of anatomy because when you have very good knowledge of anatomy and you're trying to study the space of infection it will be easy for you super easy uh, this infection coming from upper um, first molar it will go to buccal space infection or it will go to the upper way or it will go to vestibular infection it depends on the pass of insertion of the vaccinator muscle if it go upper it go lower then you understand it so if i'm explaining this to you and you don't have solid knowledge of anatomy it will be very difficult for you to understand it but when you have solid knowledge of anatomy it will be super easy for you to understand surgery same for management and pharma we, if you know the pharma drugs if you know how it works it will be easy for you to understand the management and how we are dealing with emergency in the office so i, I would recommend you to, when you study to get your knowledge to be accumulated when you accumulate your knowledge it will be easy for you to feel confident about your study about your knowledge and then explain it to any, everyone so i would like you to do this exercise now this last two question and this last first three question of ortho try to get your notes write your notes down as an a as an b try to explain it to yourself try to think about it i'm going to write the note here get the mean value know the variation to b2 and then orthognostic, retrognostic, the SNA, SNB, AMB, what the meaning of every angle. And then call some one of your friends studying for the AFK exam and try to explain to him. If you understand it, voila, you're good. Now you are in a good position. You understand the concept. You can explain it to someone. So you did the 3D dimension of like studying and your knowledge will be solid for a very long time. Thank you for watching. I hope you can... Um, try this way of studying um, i think it will be very beneficial for you and um, have a good weekend and see you next sunday